Hi everyone, my name is Andres Arriola and I'll be moderating today's panel discussion on experiences of an LGBTQ plus person in STEM. Um, the focus of this panel discussion is going to be addressing systemic inequalities and explaining how identity can shape someone's experiences. Um, I'll go ahead and give everyone a, a background of who I am. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Andres Arriola, pronouns he, him. Um, and I'm going to be moderating today's panel discussion. Um, I'm currently an employee of the National Park Service working in the San Francisco Regional Office. Um, the, opinions, the opinions I share today are my own and I will be speaking as a citizen and not a representative of the National Park Service. I received my BS in, uh, from San Jose State University in Chemical Engineering. During my time at San Jose State, I co-founded the Surface Science Center Lab where I synthesized nanoparticles for novel cancer detection. I utilize equipment as, at institutions such as the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and Stanford's National Accelerator Laboratory to accomplish my work. During my early years at San Jose State, I took on the role of Science Extravaganza Chair. The goal of Science Extravaganza is to encourage underrepresented and economically disadvantaged youth in San Jose to pursue a career in STEM. In addition, I facilitated interactive learning experiences in collaboration with industry professionals to demonstrate computer programming workshops and fractal geometry workshops. I first came to be involved with Silicon Valley Pride as a media volunteer for the 2020 celebrations. This year, I have taken on moderating this incredible panel and will be also helping with archiving 2021 uh, celebrations this August. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce each of the panelists. First up is Dr. Sek. Dr. Sek, pronouns she, her, is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and the Department of Mechanical Engineering by courtesy at the University of Michigan. Before coming to UM, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Clayman Institute for Gender Research at Stanford University and was on faculty at Rice University. She earned her PhD in sociology from UC San Diego and undergraduate degrees in electrical and sociology, electrical engineering and sociology from Montana State University. Sex research examines cultural mechanisms of inequality reproduction, especially through seemingly nuanced cultural beliefs and practices. Her work on inequality in science, technology, engineering, and math professions focuses on the recruitment and retention of women, people of color, and LGBTQ identifying persons in STEM degree programs and STEM jobs. Her research has appeared in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science, Science Advances, the American Journal of Sociology, and the American Sociolo Sociological Review. Her research has been covered by the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, Time, Harvard Business Review, and the new sections of Science and Nature. In 2020, she was named one of Business Equity Magazine's 40 LGBTQ plus leaders under 40. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Sek. Next up is Dr. Cameron Kim. Dr. Cameron Kim, pronouns he, him, is a lecturer in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Duke University. He completed his PhD in bioengineering at Stanford University, where he focused on, on, on RNA and Melanian synthetic biology strategies in, cultural, in con, controlled genetic behaviors, or to control control to control genetic behaviors. <laughs> Cameron has taught courses from high school and undergraduate students to explore current research and project-based learning in fundamentals of engineering biology while advocating for students across diverse backgrounds. Since starting at Duke, he has joined the Pratt School of Engineering Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Community Committee to advocate for changes in processes and outcomes for students, especially in the LGBTQ community as a gay man. He completed his bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering and mathematics from Duke University in 2014. In his free time, Cameron trains as a competitive curler and has competed in three national tournaments with the Silicon Valley Curling Club. Next up is, is Victor Ramos, PE. Victor Ramos is a structural project engineer for Ashley Advanced Engineering, Inc., designing structures through the, throughout the West Coast. Originally from Guadalupe, California, he received his bachelor's in architectural engineering and a minor in Spanish from California Polytech State University, where he was part of the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers and a brother of New Alpha Kappa Fraternity Inc., a Latino-based fraternity. He began his career in the Bay Area working on precast concrete facades for tech campuses. 
and podium concrete structures. While working at Ashley and Vance, he obtained his master's in science in civil engineering and a minor in construction from San Jose State University. With the vast array of project types, his expertise lies in custom residential and commercial structures. In his free time, he enjoys traveling the world and attending sports events with friends and family. Next up is last, but certainly not least, Dr. Julie Johnson. Dr. Juliet Johnson, pronouns she, they, is a postdoctoral researcher at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, studying how carbon cycling microbes in wetlands are impacted by climate change. In addition to research, Dr. Johnson's passion has been connecting with, the, with LGBTQ plus youth and getting them inspired by science. She came out as a trans woman while an undergrad at Klinsman University before moving to her PhD in environmental engineering at the University of Minnesota. During her PhD, she volunteered as a trans teen facilitator with Transforming Families, which helped support trans youth in their, and their parents. Her work with the LGBTQ plus teens quickly morphed into a new program she founded, Queer Science. Queer Science is the first outreach program dedicated to connecting LGBTQ plus teens with LGBTQ plus scientists through hands-on demonstration and experiments. She hopes to bring similar outreach to her new home in the Bay Area, where she, is where she currently resides with her adorably spoiled Husky mixed dog, Harper. Well, I'm very excited to hear what each of these individuals has to share about their experiences in STEM. Um, but before we get into the panel discussion questions, I wanna hand things over off to Dr. Sack so we can explore her research a little bit and so she can give us a foundation um, and a glimpse into what the system looks like right now. Dr. Sack. Wonderful. Thank you, Andres, for all of your work to organize us today and for bringing this panel to life. Um, as Andres said, I'm going to share a little bit about um, some of my work in the space of LGBTQ inequality in STEM. Uh, the work I'll be presenting today is primarily based on uh, publications in Science Advances that came out uh, earlier this year. It is open access, so you're welcome to use the QR code to get to my website um, and see uh, these results in much more depth than I'll be presenting to you today. So what I'll be talking about is results from something called the STEM inclusion study. I'm the principal investigator of the study, and the goal was to understand the experiences of LGBTQ identifying persons compared to otherwise similar non uh, LGBTQ identifying persons in STEM to understand where whether the kinds of disadvantages we see for LGBTQ identifying workers in the US labor force broadly are actually existing in STEM as well. And prior to this work, we haven't been able to really effectively or robustly show uh, these potential disadvantages. Um, the work I'll be presenting today is important not only for showing whether and what kinds of disadvantages there might be, but also uh, in my experience presenting this work in uh, in tech companies and in uh, industry and in other un and university settings, that these are some of the most compelling ways to convince others of the need for change. So uh, I'll be addressing four questions in my short presentation today. First, are LGBTQ STEM professionals equally qualified for and dedicated to their STEM work as non-LGBTQ identifying STEM professionals. This is an important thing to study because although those of us who are part of the community and our allies um, would expect that there aren't these differences, those who might be critical of these kinds of patterns or skeptical of them might be wanting to um, uh, explain these kinds of differences as LGBTQ persons just not working as hard or as not as educated as non-LGBTQ persons. So that's an important thing to examine. The second question is, do LGBTQ identifying STEM professionals experience more disrespect and exclusion in their STEM workplaces, more harassment than non-LGBTQ all, than their non-LGBTQ colleagues? Do they have higher turnover intentions? Meaning, are they more uh, interested in or plan to leave STEM entirely compared to otherwise similar non-LGBTQ peers? And then, do these issues, do these concerns get under individual skin? Do LGBTQ STEM professionals report more negative health and wellness outcomes than otherwise similar non-LGBTQ STEM professionals? 
The data I'll be using to uh, ex examine these questions uh, come from an NSF-funded study uh, where I surveyed over 25,000 STEM professionals in the United States, over a thousand of whom identify as LGBTQ. Uh, and this was in the form of uh, confidential surveys of 21 STEM professional societies and organizations in the US. So to give you a sense of what this sample looked like, uh, about 4.5% of the entire sample identified as LGBTQ. This is about what we would expect in the STEM, in the STEM population broadly. And about 0.85% uh, uh, identify as transgender, genderqueer, or gender non-binary. So regarding that first question, are LGBTQ STEM professionals as qualified and dedicated as their non-LGBTQ peers? And what we find is yes, there's no difference by LGBTQ status in education level, in the number of hours people work per week, in uh, people's willingness to put in additional effort into their jobs, and in the importance to people of their STEM work. So the things that I'll show you in the next slides can't be attributed to differences along these lines. The second question is, do LGBTQ STEM professionals experience devaluation and marginalization in their STEM workforce? And unfortunately, the answer is yes. So the dark purple bars here represent LGBTQ identifying persons compared to the lighter purple bars for non-LGBTQ persons. And here, uh, LGBTQ identifying persons experience significantly greater levels of professional devaluation more social marginalization and greater levels of harassment than otherwise similar non-LGBTQ peers. I also find this to be the case for turnover intentions. So LGBTQ persons uh, are more likely to think about leaving their STEM job in the last year and are, are um, more likely to plan to leave the STEM profession entirely in the next five years. So for example here, 22% of LGBTQ identifying STEM professionals have thought about leaving their STEM job in the last year compared to only 15% of uh, non-LGBTQ identifying persons. And this is where it gets um, really, uh, really troubling. Um, so what we find is that LGBTQ uh, identifying persons experience more negative health and wellness issues in their uh, jobs. They're more likely to experience stress from work, more likely to have minor health problems, and more likely to experience insomnia than otherwise similar non-LGBTQ peers. And also, those disadvantages in the workplace, devaluation, marginalization, help explain why there are these more negative health and wellness outcomes. So we also find some important intersectional patterns I'll just uh, nod to here. So for example, transgender and gender non-binary respondents were more likely to experience minor health problems and stress and depressive symptoms than cisgender sexual minorities. LGBTQ identifying women were more likely than LGBTQ identifying men to experience professional devaluation and harassment. And the same for LGBTQ identifying persons of color vis-a-vis -vis LGBTQ identifying white persons persons. So what this shows uh, at a high level is that LGBTQ STEM professionals experience professional devaluation, greater marginalization, fewer professional opportunities, and have higher turnover, turnover, turnover intentions than similar non-LGBTQ professionals, even though they're equally qualified and dedicated to their STEM work. To wrap up here, I want to point to some uh, potential implications of these results um, for LGBTQ STEM professionals themselves. This isn't just an issue of social devaluation in the STEM workforce, but professional devaluation of one's skills. This indicates obstacles to professional advancements for LGBTQ persons and deeply troubling health and wellness outcomes related to these disadvantages. But this is not just bad for LGBTQ STEM professionals, it's bad for STEM broadly. It shows the undervaluation and under recognition of the contributions of these highly qualified and skilled persons. It undercuts diversification that we know helps to advance innovation. And we see the potential for loss of talent uh, of these individuals in STEM. 
So how briefly might we support LGBTQ STEM professionals in Silicon Valley? And I think our conversation in this workshop today will give us some more ideas, but here's uh, just three uh, to keep in mind. First is the uh, vital importance of LGBTQ inclusive anti-discrimination policies in organizations. These, these things need to be on the books and need to be very clear and uh, resonant uh, among workers. Uh, second is the importance of employee resource groups and workplaces, uh, spots where LGBTQ identifying persons can gather and network and seek to advocate for uh, each other and uh, themselves. And then the importance of LGBTQ aff affiliate groups within professional societies. Again, spaces for gathering, networking, uh, and uh, advancement. And with that, I look forward to a conversation with the rest of the panelists. You're muted, sorry. There we go, <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you, Dr. Sek. That was an incredible presentation and incredible facts to lay a foundation of what, of again, what the system looks like right now and what are the, what are the hurdles that we as members of the LGBTQ plus community that have a love for science, that a technology, engineering and mathematics face um, and that kind of, that segues us perfectly into the first question that I have is why do you love STEM and why would you recommend it to others? It's a difficult field of study. Um, so what, what was, what's the, what's the ember that sparked the love for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics? Um, uh, Dr. Kim, can you speak on that? Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think for me, one of the reasons why I've always been sort of a attached or attracted to STEM and wanting to, I think, see the pursuit of knowledge happen. I think you read about people in history that have, you know, made these fantastic discoveries. I'm a bioengineer, so I thought the discovery of DNA, and I think about uh, what we can do with the technology that we have today, even. so. I've always really wanted to be a part of that history, also because I didn't always see faces like myself in those fields, and I wanted to sort of make, uh, uh, you know, make my identity an important part of how I approach science. So for me, that ability to you know, create something from scratch that's never been, you know, made before, that was something that really drew me in, and. I'm very fortunate that within my PhD and my time here at Duke, that I've also been surrounded by a really diverse group of other scientists and engineers. Um, but I also still, you know, as Dr. Sex said, I think we see the need for that to be more prominent and to be more uh, expressed in all industries. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Victor, why, why did you choose to, to study STEM and specifically in the construction field, which um, traditionally has a very heteronormative, very masculine workforce. Um, can you, can you go ahead and, and share what sparked you, what was the ember that sparked your interest in STEM? Yeah, this, this I would say started from a young age. Um, I'm from a small agricultural community in the Central Coast. Um, so for me, honestly, the first thing that sparked the interest were Legos. I love playing with Legos. I love building. Uh, little buildings with Legos and having my parents allow me to um, have that creativity and work on this. Um, but coming from a, a small rural agriculture community, you don't have a lot of uh, role models um, being first generation college student. Um, so my older brother, who's also a structural engineer, um, he kind of paved the way. So having people that look like you, um, that come from similar background as you kind of open your eyes to what's out there. Um, so being kind of like one of the older cousins that went to college, became an engineer, that kind of was a drive for the family and construction engineering um, is very white collar. You, I know I'm on job sites wearing boots, jeans, mud. Um, so yeah, there is a dynamic where you see this very um, macho type and 
sometimes it's like, do I fit in? Do I belong here? And the more I'm there, the more I know I do belong there. So I think it's just the progression of, you know, seeing people like yourself in these fields uh, to continue to grow the the uh, the STEM field. Yeah, and really taking taking your space, the space that you deserve. Thank you for that, um, Dr. Johnson. Do you want to share what sparked your your interest in STEM? A lot of my interest in STEM kind of similarly came from like the Legos part with what you were saying of just like growing up and like getting to play with them. I had one cousin, Christina, who was like, she was on the robotics team for her high school and things like that. And she's the one who like, I kind of just mimicked her throughout most of my life of like, she played like ice hockey and I tried to play ice hockey at like her and do whatever. She started doing like math clubs and stuff like that. And I started to try and follow. So she's definitely like the biggest like role model and inspiration that I had growing up. But I definitely lost that for a while, especially after like high school. And during my first part of college, I started off in community college and I was a psychology student because I thought I had more personal questions that I wanted to answer. And I thought like having going through like high school, which was like a really depressive episode for me, I wanted to help other people through that way. And it took a lot of self-exploration as well as just like meeting some other like queer engineers out there and realizing that like I wanted to be a psychologist to really answer these questions about myself. It wasn't really directly about other people. And once I started seeing some semblance of role models, that's kind of what got me going and looking back at engineering and being like, oh yeah, I was doing this like for most of my life already. I should just pick this up and continue with it. Thank you for sharing that. And then Dr. Sack, do you want to share what sparked your interest to go into um, electrical engineering? Um, that's not an easy, that's not an easy degree to get. <laughs> sure. Um, I do want to apologize that my slides uh, were not visible, visibly advancing. Um, if you, uh, you Google me, uh, ErinASec.com, um, you can go to my website and you can see, uh, access the paper that has all the information. Um, so I went into electrical engineering um, because uh, my grandmother was blind and I was really uh, concerned about the lack of assistive technologies to make her life better and her lack of ability to access the kinds of technological innovations that were happening when I was in high school. Um, and I went into electrical engineering and, and did well, but I found that in that space, there was um, little consideration of conversations about social justice and inequality. And I found I needed other tools from other disciplines to be able to come in and be able to speak authoritatively and rigorously about differences uh, and inequalities within STEM. And that's why I went to sociology for my PhD. Thank you for that. And I think everyone on the panel very much appreciates the work that you're doing. <laughs> there's not a lot of there's not a lot of individuals that are that are pursuing this conversation and that are paving the way and bringing in data to seeing again what the system looks like. Um, so I will transition into our uh, second question. Um, thank you everyone for sharing what what drove your interest into STEM. Um, STEM is not STEM majors are difficult. Um, they're not easy. I think everyone here had to take thermo. It's uh, <laughs> they're challenging courses. Um, what made some of us have to teach that? thermo? <laughs> <laughs> and then there's that. <laughs> um, what made it more challenging as an LGBTQ plus person? And then uh, kind of to add some anecdotals to Dr. Sex's work. Um, what, have you ever questioned whether your love for STEM is enough to pursue or continue pursuing a career in it? Um, Dr. Johnson, do you wanna go ahead and kick off this, this question? Yeah, so I came out while I was an undergrad at Clemson University in South Carolina, and it was pretty terrifying at the time because there was still so few queer people who were out on campus. I was only one of four trans women who were even visible on campus at the time. And our department was small enough that like, I was taking classes with the same 24 students at like our graduating class, we were doing everything together. And to potentially risk losing them as a support group was just really nerve wracking. And thankfully they have been like quite fantastic. But there were a couple of professors who like, one of them notably like 
threw me out of their office and told me that like they would have tried to push me out of the program. And literally the day that I came out to them was the last time I've ever spoken to them. And they just ignored me for the rest of um, my program and such. Um, there was a whole bunch of other incidents throughout like my career. And so I tried to start learning how to use this as like a better tool where, especially for like grad school, where I made sure that I was very visibly out on every single application. I still do this to this day because if you're not going to be accepting of me, like right at face value, I don't want to work for you. So I've definitely probably lost some opportunities, but also I just see a rejection letter at that point and I get to kind of continue on and just try and find the people who will be really great and fantastic. And like my current position, I'm pretty sure I'm the well, I'm pretty sure I'm the only out person in like my small group of like people at Livermore. There's definitely more queer people at Livermore, but our small group. But they've all just been really fantastic, and it hasn't really been a question. Um, but your other part of this was like, do you ever question them like leaving? Is this enough of like a drive? Yeah. And the answer is kind of yes or yes and no for that, where. For the most part, I really do love just doing the science and like getting like really into the nitty gritty work. And like, I had a really frustrating project recently and I was complaining about it. And my coworker was like, you secretly love this. And I was like, I do actually, yes. Mm -hmm. Like totally spot on of just like all the frustration. Mm -hmm. But I think I also need to supplement it with something like my outreach work where I have something that's a little bit more direct to the community and I feel a little bit more engaged and like, science can be really slow. I might not see the results of my work for quite a long time, especially mm -hmm. if you're doing research work. Mm -hmm. So having that outreach where it's a little bit more direct, a little bit more connected, at least keeps at bay those feelings of like, oh my gosh, I should just pack up and like go do something completely different and start that other dream job. You know, yeah. there's many things I would love to do, but I also really enjoy this very much so. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned, or actually horrible that you mentioned, um, that one of your professors gave you that sort of treatment. I mean, as I remember in high school, um, my teachers would tell us, yeah, like professors might not be the best at like educators. They might not know the best at teaching because a lot of professors don't take courses on how to teach, but they're experts in their field and they're leaders in their field. Um, and as someone wanting to embark on a study in STEM and push and even the drive to go to do a PhD to drive the envelope of human knowledge, um, getting that type of feedback from somebody who's supposed to be a leader in this field, um, that's very damaging. And I'm sorry that you had that experience. Thanks. I think it just contributes to like our stereotypes that we have of like the queer student where they're all like the liberal arts student who is like the theater kid and whatnot, because your identity can be a little bit more quickly interwoven to your, like your identity can be more quickly interwoven to your work and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Whereas in STEM, it is so often just like this massive divide that like most of these professors, even the ones who are trying to be good, just don't have to think about it. And they can push all of the justice work that they should be doing often keep it in the back of their mind for way too long until now where we're kind of at this like boiling point of needing social work and social justice. Yeah, because although the numbers um, are small, um, we are seeing that there is an, I think we're, there's an increase than there, at least a larger increase of LGBTQ plus people in STEM than there was 10 years ago. Um, so as we push the envelope in representation, I think, yeah, we're meeting these, this interface of, of pushback um, thank you again for sharing your story. Um, Dr. Kim, do you want to, do you want to go ahead and, uh, um, and answer a question to the, why did you choose, uh, to continue pursuing a, a career in STEM and why did you choose a STEM field when it's so difficult? And have you ever felt like your love and your passion for discovery, um, and for STEM itself is enough to continue pursuing a career in it? I would say that uh, the one of the, I think uh, Dr. Johnston brought up the point, you know, having that community and having people that support you every step of the way is so critical. You know, that element, that, that essence of belonging is such a, such an important factor in your education career, especially as an undergrad where you're sort of 
you know, on your own for the first time and you're discovering a lot of, you know, new things about yourself and the world around you and what you can do for the world. So I definitely, uh, you know, I, I kind of similarly when I started my undergrad career trying to really figure out who I was going to be and uh, sort of being as out as I thought I could be. I guess I was, you know, not really sure what that meant at the moment, mm-hmm. who, you know, who was available for me as a resource. I'm very fortunate that here with the uh, Center for Sexual and Gender Diversity at Duke, that there was a lot of support, but I would say still looking at students, there was hard to find other LGBTQ plus students in engineering. And I've written about this in various statements and you know, applications that the number of engineering faculty that I can identify that I identify as uh, LGBTQ plus is on one hand. Uh, and, and that is uh, difficult to find a place where you can feel like you belong. And I, this is a phrase that I know comes up a lot at Stanford, it comes up at a lot of places, it comes up here at Duke, is this idea of imposter syndrome. The idea that you don't, uh, you, that why am I here? You know, did I, you know, sneak in the back door? Did I, you know, do I truly belong here? And I experienced that a lot in my career, um, especially in terms of how I approach teaching and in terms of how I approach uh, you know, b- being in, in STEM, how do I, you know, how do I sort of wrestle with my LGBTQ, my, my, my identity? How do I bring it into the classroom? Or am I supposed to just keep it quiet? Am I just supposed mm-hmm. to, you know, not, you know, this, it's not a, this critical part of who I am, but the reality is it is. The reality is that being queer is an important part of my identity and that needs to be embraced in the classroom. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of interesting studies and work out there that show that many queer folks identify as STEM stronger than they identify as LGBTQ. And, and that's an interesting element because then it sort of, it it negates that important part of who we are. And I think as Dr. Sheck has kind of mentioned that without that essence of belonging, it can be difficult. So I, you know, I I struggle with that in terms of just wanting to go and pursue academia, but I also know that if I don't stay in, or if I don't stay in teaching um, and really embrace who I am, you know, so many of these engineers won't ever see a queer person teaching them. So I think that that's something that I really, I think about that a lot is when you're an engineer and you're working to create social and better goods, you need to do that for all peoples. And if, Queer people, if you know they're not a part of your list, if BIPOC people are not a part of your list of who you're engineering for, then you're not in engineering for the right reason. Yeah, yeah, powerful statement. Thank you for that. Um, it's uh, interesting you mentioned that you've had this imposter syndrome because you <laughs> look at who's teaching you, you look at who's again, who are the leaders in this industry who are the ones pushing the envelope and you see no reflection of yourself. And I think for the most part, that's a shared experience. Um, and it's important to say that, that it's a shared experience, a shared experience that, yeah, we don't see ourselves in the lectures. We don't see ourselves in our peers even. Um, and it does make the STEM field in our STEM study a very lonely place to be. Um, and I think everyone on this panel and everyone that's LGBTQ plus um, shares in that experience. Um, and so although we do feel that level of loneliness, um, I think this conversation is showing that we're not actually alone. Um, so thank you for thank you for that statement, Dr. Kim. Um, so I'll go ahead and go into our third question. Um, do you feel, have you felt safe expressing your queerness in STEM spaces? And how do your other backgrounds influence your experience as an LGBTQ plus person in STEM? Uh, that second question touches on intersectionality. Um, I'm personally a first generation college graduate, first generation Mexican American, and um, I'm LGBTQ plus. Each of those um, sort of categories has its own unique experience, but them coupled, them, the unification of all three kind of creates this fourth extremely unique experience. Um, So I would love to hear um, your guys' experiences. Um, Dr. Johnson, do you wanna go ahead and kick this one off? Yeah, sure. 
So for the most part, I feel generally pretty safe about how I'm expressing myself, especially it is a little bit situation dependent. So like at conferences or like other like outreach type events and stuff like that, I tend to be much louder than I might normally be. Um, during like some of my field work is used to be up in like Brainerd in the middle of like Minnesota, like very rural conservative area. So I definitely had to do a little bit of code switching where I, I, I can't really turn queerness off necessarily, but I can definitely like tone it down just because I was out there mostly alone often and just not feeling as safe. So just having to figure out what, what makes me feel comfortable, but also feeling safe has to be a part of that. And then right now at work with like my coworkers, like I can be out and vocal, but I'm a little bit less aggressive than I am with like some of those like conference spaces, just because at a conference you might have like two seconds to make a point to someone or just like, if you're out in the world or whatever, you might just have that like brief moment where it's like, hey, this is what happened here. So let me tell you all these things or whatever and how we can make this better done. And, like make this is what was going on. But with work, since you're constantly like seeing your coworkers, you don't want to be as like abrasive all the time and you can work with them a little bit like slower, a little bit longer. You can just like, I will tend to like tone that down a little bit. Maybe it's not even like tone it down. It's just like, you can have that conversation last a little bit longer and go into more details and you can add a little bit more like personal story to it. So I definitely feel pretty safe at work talking about those things, but there is some code switching that needs to happen. You're muted again. Thank you for that. Um, I said, uh, thank you for, for sharing that experience and for kind of giving an understanding of what it's like to be a member of the LGBT plus community um, and having to have though that second layer of thought just in your everyday life that you feel like you need to do code switching. You have to add this additional layer of kind of filtering out to make other people feel comfortable. Um, I think that kind of gives a little illustration again of what it's like to be an LGBTQ plus person in STEM. Um, Victor, do you wanna go ahead and share your um, your experiences as um, in relating to have, do you feel safe? Have you felt safe expressing your queerness and how your experience as a Latino has influenced your experience as an LGBTQ plus person in STEM? Yeah, I, I think that the first part about feeling safe at work or just in the shoes of a STEM individual, um, I, I just wanted to sh uh, share a short story about when I first started on my current company um, just over five years ago. We were a satellite branch that had just opened. So I was the first full-time employee there. There's only three of us in the office. Um, and we were gonna be going to our company party down in the Central Coast company-wide with you know, 50, 60 plus people plus their families and friends. Um, so that was the first time I was gonna be meeting a lot of people for the first time in person, um, just through video chats we had communicated. So knowing that one of my old classmates worked in the San Barbara office who does identify as uh, queer himself, I was able to you know message him on the side and be like, hey, how is this work? Is it okay if I bring my boyfriend? Is that something that's gonna be, you know, looked as weird or shunned or, and he's like, no, I I personally took my boyfriend last year to the party. So when I showed up to the party and, you know, I was there with my partner and everyone was completely embracing and fine. And um, since the five years from working now, I feel completely comfortable speaking, um, being open about who I am. Um, and they're very embracing. Um, a lot of them have, you know, we've connected personally outside of work. Um, they've, you know, hung out with me and uh, my group of uh, friends who most of them are identify as queer. So I feel that the more that you're true to yourself and find that comfortable space um, at a company that allows you to be yourself, uh, you're able to flourish. So for me, that's that's been very helpful. And in terms of being a Latino, 
um, that has also brought its difficulties as my company um, is majority uh, white. So being one of the few minorities um, as a Latino and as a queer person, um, that adds an extra uh, layer to it, um, trying to see leadership as leadership is, you know, all non-minorities. Um, so trying to insert myself in the mix, um, trying to be vocal for myself and for those that might not be as vocal. So I've kind of taken it upon myself to, you know, keep putting myself in the conversation uh, to tr try to be as vocal um, as possible. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, you're, un, you received your undergraduate degree from Cal Poly um, in, down in San Luis Obispo. How was that experience? Um, you were part of the, you're part of SHIP, the Society of Hispanic in Professional Engineers, as well as a Latino-based fraternity. Um, how did those two experiences um, coincide with your experience in the classroom? Yeah, so, Cal Poly, uh, where I did my undergrad, is a very large science technology school, a lot of engineers. Um, it's also predominantly white. Um, so stepping in first generation, I had to find those spaces um, where I felt comfortable, um, where I could be myself um, and flourish. So uh, one of the things was my fraternity, which is a Latino fraternity, um, and I remember you know, my first quarter there um, while I was trying to join the fraternity, um, I pretty much, you know, was myself, outed myself um, to the group of guys. And the, the ones I was with trying to join the fraternity, you know, embraced me. They saw no, no different from me from them. We have too many similarities for this to be one thing that, you know, puts us apart. And once I, once I became a member, um, I was told by the older uh, individuals in the in the fraternity that you know I was pretty much the first out pledge uh, joining the fraternity that they knew of across uh, the West Coast where we're located. So for me, I was like, how am I the first out uh, you know pledge to join? Um, and they took a big interest in uh, me being gay. Um, they, you know, wanted to have workshops with the Pride Center. So the Pride Center would come into our meetings and do a little presentation. Um, they wanted to volunteer and be involved as well. So that was very, very, uh, you know, heartwarming for me. And I'm glad since I've left Cal Poly, I do go back and visit. And there's a lot more uh, out uh, brothers in my fraternity. Um, they're a lot more accepting and growing, and I think the community has just grown so much more than this macho, machismo, Latino mentality. Um, we're not, you know, it's a lot more open. So that's, that to me has, uh, I'm very happy about. That's great. Um, thank you for sharing that. I think that um, between Dr. Johnson's and Victor's um, anecdotal stories, I think we're getting an understanding of People in the LGBTQ plus community are scared. There's this, there's a, there's a feeling and an emotion of fear when it comes to being a part of these spaces. Um, and I think that coupled with Dr. Sex's work, we're seeing that the outcome of that is that people don't feel comfortable bringing their whole selves into these spaces. And with the outcome being we don't have a lot of representation, we don't have a lot of LGBTQ plus people going into these spaces and the ones that do, um, they're met with adversity. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and, um, and ask the fourth question in the series of questions. Um, uh, and then this one, I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Sek to kick off. Um, how have you ad how have you had to advocate for yourself? Have you felt do you feel safe stepping up for someone else? And in either of those situations, how could an ally have helped? Thank you for that question. Um, it really depends on where you are uh, in a particular moment and also mm -hmm. where you are in your career trajectory. So um, I've experienced this and, and the, the folks that have engaged in my research qualitatively through interviews and focus groups have articulated this as well, that um, advocacy for oneself and others um, 
starts with um, assessing where you are and what makes you feel safe and comfortable. And mm -hmm. if advocating for yourself or others in that place potentially puts you at risk, that's a point of reflection. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're always going to be at that particular uh, place in the career hierarchy. So every step that we go in our careers, even if we go from being a high school student to a first year undergraduate, or a first year undergraduate to a graduate student or a graduate student to a postdoc and beyond. Um, we have people who are farther down on the career trajectory than we are, that we have the opportunity to encourage, to advocate for, to uh, be um, a mentor for. And that is so powerful. And that's one of the most exciting things to me in the space of LGBTQ equality conversations is to say, I have been able, I've been lucky and privileged enough to be um, um, at this position in my career, how can I help lift the people who are coming behind me, make them more comfortable, make them have someone to look to and have conversations about what's safe, what's not, et cetera. But alongside that, I also wanna mention that um, it's a lot of work that we're doing. So the conversations that we've had already have said, I have done this additional labor, I have put this additional work in um, to help myself and help others. But it's also really important to uh, turn to our super advisors and our managers and say, I want to make visible for you the work that I've been doing. How can I get credit for this? Because you're not just making the organization better for you, you're making the organization better for the workers that are coming uh, alongside you and behind you. So as we're doing this work of being a mentor, of being visible, it's also important to claim credit for it, to say, I'm doing work that adds value and I want to be recognized for that work um, above and beyond um, the potential social contributions it makes. Thank you for that. Great response. Um, Dr. Johnson, do you want to go ahead and follow up with how you advocate for yourself, how you have to advocate for others, um, and how an ally could have helped in helped you in either situation? Yeah, there's a lot of times I've had to work and like advocate for myself. Like even when I just started um, grad school, one of the first um, one of the first things that happened when I started grad school was you get assigned your own like office space and like an office mate. And apparently the person who does the like administrative work to assign those office spaces outed me to everyone because they wanted to make sure that whoever was sharing an office mate was comfortable with the trans person. And they thought they were doing something good that they were trying to like help me, but then also just completely put out there that like, I was trans and like out of me without my permission. And so that was things that I tried to deal with a little bit more quietly, like talk to that person. And it ended up having to blow up into this other thing that just really made me feel like that troublesome person. Like I'm the burden and not like this thing happened to me. And that was really difficult to recover from. So I tend to be a little bit more quieter when it comes to advocating for myself at this point, especially since I know that I can be myself like very resilient and that like my hard work and effort can shine through other people's kind of problematic garbage. Like I had a very abusive um, advisor when I first started off too and ended up leaving that person. And there was like a couple of arrangements and things like that made. And I kept my head down mostly for that. But later on, when they started being abusive to another woman who was now a trainee of theirs, and I was also later in my PhD where I have a little bit more power. I know like I am out the door very soon. I have all the things I need done. Then I started feeling like I have power to advocate for them and like really try to help them out. And there's at least been further conversations about like getting this professor help and assistance, but even throughout all of this and even throughout the entirety of like this one person outing me, not a single person in our department had ever attended like an ally training. That was never even like a question. It was just like, oh, this thing happened and we're just gonna try to push it away and like under the rug as fast as we can. Cause a lot of those depart, like a lot of those departments just don't wanna put in that work. So you have to advocate for yourself and just kind of pick your battles of what's worthwhile because I've only got so much energy in the day and I'd rather help other people when I know I can like take the abuse myself a little bit more. 
Dr. Kim, how do you want to, thank you for that, Dr. Johnson. Um, Dr. Kim, do you want to share um, your insights on this? Sure, I, I would say, you know, I think about the, ex I, I think one of the toughest parts that I've had to do, I think, with my career is, I think, you know, people have said this, you know, to have to basically out myself in everything that I do. And that takes a lot of energy to have to figure out where, what spaces are, you know, or the, the juggling act of, you know, okay, this is the space that I'm in and how do I, you know, like, how am I saying it? How am I doing it? And there's this sort of, there's this, uh, it's called covering. You know, this idea that you have to cover certain parts of your identity in a certain room. So, yeah, I think that's been some of the hardest uh, stuff. And for me, I, I've tried to take it as a way, you know, as a bit of resilience and as a way to get stronger is to really say, say who I am out loud. And I thought about this the other day um, as I'm preparing some lectures for next year. I, I'm also a first generation college student. Um, I'm also a Duke alum, and now that I'm teaching here, I tell my students that day one, and yet I never told them that I identify as a BTQ. And, and that's something that I'm going to change, because I think that that's one of the strongest ways that I can advocate for myself, and to also let my students know that, again, I think as Dr. Sheka said, like, you know, make it better for somebody else, just to know that, they, that you know, that I am there as a resource. But I think going to where uh, others can really play a role in in this is, I think, some of the different trainings that I've been fortunate to see our department and to see the School of Engineering here do in terms of implicit bias training and in terms of pronouns training uh, through various organizations here on campus. And that's been really helpful. It's also been very encouraging to see a large number of faculty and staff attend them. Uh, that has been, you know, without really any major hooks or any sort of, you know, quote unquote requirements, I think that it's really encouraging to see that people are are really looking to these as modes, as ways to learn. Um, but I can also uh, think back to some uh, one of those trainings where one of our faculty members commented and how uh, how they view the department, how they view the engineering school as a very normative place to be, and how it's you know, it can be very difficult for LGBTQ folks to you know be to be who they are. And as somebody who is potentially the only out queer faculty member in the engineering school right now, at least to my knowledge, that was comforting, actually. I, it, well, it was comforting and it was also a, okay, well, this is, <laughs> there's a lot of work that still needs to be done if this is, you know, this is how, you know, the history of the department and history of the school has been. So I, I think that there are ways for, you know, leadership i think to see and really work with different groups and work with individuals to say what do you need what's going to allow you to succeed and to embrace all of your identities in the classroom because students don't leave their identities at the door why should faculty why should lecturers why should staff why should grad students you know leave their identities at the door they should all be a part of what you you know what you bring to the table Thank you for that. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask the last question, the last prepared question in the series. Um, we go ahead, we've talked about why we love STEM, the hurdles and sort of the adversity that, that we've faced in, in our pursuit to expanding the envelope of human knowledge and in our pursuit of understanding science, technology, engineering, and mathematics and, and being a leader in these fields. Um, and we've also talked about how we've had to advocate for ourselves, how we have had to advocate for others. Um, so I sort of want to ask, what tangible outcomes have you seen from diversity and inclusion groups? And are these LGBTQ specific? Um, there's been uh, sort of the hot topic for the past couple of years has been diversity. We want to diversify these fields. We want to bring in people that aren't normally part of of the conversation into the conversation because we need new ideas. We the, the problems of tomorrow are going to need a workforce where people are comfortable bringing their whole selves into the into the office, right? That's sort of the narrative that that's being played um, by established institutions. So a lot of them uh, create um, these cultural groups. Um, but what are the outcomes of them from your guys' experience? 
And then I'll go ahead and let um, uh, Victor go ahead and kick this one off. Yeah, I, I think that um, what I've seen personally in my current company, um, we're about 100 employees uh, in the West Coast. And um, it wasn't just till earlier this year that we had our first female um, principal, which is a leadership role. So it's been all men. Um, and seeing the first woman was very, I was happy. Um, you know, finally we were having something, there's some steps towards that. Um, and I've been lucky enough to be able to sit through uh, leadership um, uh, meetings with leadership at the company and being the only uh, a person, a minority in the, in there has been, um, I think they're trying to see and have more voices um, speak. And one thing that my company has done this year that they've invested a lot of time and money is on emotional uh, intelligence. So it's a year long thing that we're doing lessons, uh, we're doing small group discussions, then we're doing company wide discussions to um, be able to talk about our, our emotions, to talk about how to improve ourselves in the workforce and in our personal lives. And I think with all that mixed in, it's giving everybody the tools um, to learn how to advocate for themselves in the office setting, um, to management, management to us. And I think um, from this year of EQ is what we're calling it, uh, emotional intelligence. I think a lot of good things are gonna come out of it because we've, we're starting to see small changes in how we communicate with each other and what the company is trying to achieve. So I'm very hopeful that all these trainings and um, diversity um, workshops will have some change. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Johnson, do you want to do you want to share your experiences of how of what tangible outcomes you've seen from diversity and inclusion groups? Yeah, I haven't. So there's a couple of different layers to this. And like with my own past department during grad school, I haven't really seen too much, but at least that is also its own representation of where they stand and like their inaction to be more vocal is also kind of its own red flag or at least a warning flag for a lot of other students because there is now like a new diversity initiative that is happening at the University of Minnesota and it's been growing quite a bit, especially, mm -hmm. well, there is a college of science and engineering specific one and that's been growing. And it becomes really apparent to everyone when like the chemistry department has all these professors showing up to these meetings and there isn't a single environmental engineering professor attending those kind of things. So as far as a tangible outcome, I think that given our political and like social justice environment right now, you might not have the best place, but you at least always know where people are standing and knowing that is a really valuable tool going into a place of just like, mm -hmm. these people are at least trying to do something, whether or not they are doing it as well as they could be or should be, they're open and probably more receptive to learning or just like that polarization just lets you know what you're walking into beforehand. Yeah, and I think, um, I think it's very telling as far as where we are in our fight and or in our fight for a equality in these spaces that we're at the beginning of the conversation right and so it's it's difficult to to uh to measure tangible outcomes um so thank you for that um dr kemp do you want to go ahead and share your experiences you're on a on a diversity committee um so i'd love to hear your insights definitely so i see with our uh DEIC group, I think one of the, uh, I, I think, you know, Dr. Johnson brought it up, knowing where you can go and knowing who is available to listen and to speak and is, you know, working to impact change, even if, you know, on time scales, especially in academia and academic sciences, uh, it's, it's an overall very conservative and a very slow discipline. It's really hard to see large swaths of changes happen you know, especially with us for undergraduate students in a four year time period, it's difficult. It takes people their entire tenure as a faculty member to really see something change. So I think that, you know, having these small 
uh, you know, tangible goals, I think for uh, grad students, postdocs, other staff to see and know that there are resources available, I think is actually a really useful part. And we've really made some strides to bring people in that can address those concerns of not just the students, but also the faculty and that there are faculty members that are also asking the same questions. What do I do now? I, I think that that's been a huge uh, part of this. I would say there are certain things that we need to do, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward with our uh, group to really look into some of the systemic barriers and the institutionalized racism, sexism, uh, anti-queer uh, structures that exist in how administration is formed, how recruitment of students and staff and faculty gets brought in. All of those are ways that you're gonna actually see changes happen as opposed to, uh, you have to know where the root causes of what's going on or to be able to, you know, break that barrier. So that's something that we're really doing right now. Uh, and I hope that other groups really do that to truly make those changes. Thank you for that. And then last but not least, Dr. Seck, do you want to go ahead and share your um, your experience and sort of your perspective on what tangible outcomes you've seen from diversity and inclusion groups? Um, I'm excited to hear your insight um, since you're so closely connected to to current research revolving this topic. Sure, so what the research says and what I've seen in um, the organizations and institutions I've worked with is there's really three key pieces that you need for sustained institutional change. The, one of those is not necessarily diversity training. Um, uh, that can help, but sometimes it can backfire. So the three are number one, having policies on the books that include LGBTQ persons in anti-discrimination uh, um, uh, rules and regulations. Number two is giving LGBTQ pers persons a space to gather at network and advocate for each other uh, and figure out where the problems are. And number three, uh, a process through which you come to know if there are problems. And so this can include uh, data collection. It can include sort of external um, consultants that come up, uh, come in and do um, uh, climate assessments. It can be sort of at the, at the HR level, but um, data collection to know whether there are problems and what those problems are that can uh, indicate to leaders of the organization and members of the groups what needs to be changed. Thank you for that. Um, very insightful. Um, so it doesn't look like we have any um, audience questions at this time. Um, I do have one um, that I think will help, at least for me, it'll help put it a little bit more into perspective um, why these conversations need to happen, why they need to happen in more frequency. Um, when I personally, actually a couple of moments before this, the panel got kicked off, I was feeling a sense of like this conversation that we were about to have, it felt taboo. Like it felt like I was stepping into a space that maybe I shouldn't be touching. Like maybe I shouldn't be talking about this. I shouldn't have put this together. Um, did either of you feel sort of that feeling of like, oh, I'm stepping into a taboo space um, by speaking so candidly and speaking so openly? Um, and I'll go ahead and let Dr. Johnson um, kick this one off. Um, yeah, I have that feeling all the time of like, again, it goes back to like that code switchingness of like, when do you want to like be turned on as like the very visibly queer kind of person and doing work? Or like, when do you just want to just get something done? Like I'm going through a little bit of that dilemma right now because our group has journal club soon where I'm leading that. And I've been thinking like, do I wanna pick an academic paper, like something that is very focused on my research and relevant to that and possibly get new insights on that? Or do I wanna like actually try and push like our group to read something that's more social justice and relevant to that? But there's also then like, oh, she's going to be that kind of queer who's like always doing that kind of work and like pushing like those kind of things on us. And I don't know how it's going to be received. I think it will be fine if I go either way, but I, the fact that I have to have that like mental conversation, that's like the taboo feeling of just like, oof, do I really want to even like rattle through this or like, you know, oh, be the person to always initiate that kind of conversation? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think with that, that question like that of, do I want to go there? It's, it's 
what boils down is what we're asking ourselves is, do I want to, do I truly feel comfortable bringing my entire self into the conversation? And what are the aspects of my life that are important? Um, but I want to hear what I want to hear from everyone. So, uh, Victor? Yeah, I think um, tying back to what Dr. Kim said earlier about imposter syndrome, um, I literally just had that same conversation with my really good friend who's she's uh, works for a really large uh, contractor. They're doing expansion at SFO. So she's Latina co contractor and a very dominant male uh, you know, workplace. And I was telling her how I was going to be doing this panel. And again, it's like, am I, why is my voice important in this? Should I be doing this? Like, I feel like I'm just, you know, I'm just a queer man in STEM. There's nothing special about me. And that's when she was just like, no, your voice is important. Everyone's voice is important. Um, so, you know, snap out of it and everyone's unique collective voice is what's going to change everything. So to me, that's like the big thing. It's like trying to realize that, yes, um, everyone's voice um, in this community needs to have those spaces to talk. And I'm, I'm actually glad that we're having these conversations. I'm glad too. <laughs> um, Dr. Kim? Yeah, the, I... This, there's this idea that STEM is impersonal, that it's emotionless, that it, it, it that we we're not allowed to have emotions. Everything is all on merit. Everything is all about how fast you can solve that problem, or how good you or what budget you keep to. And I, if you go back to the you know through the history books and you look at some of the scientists and what they've had to do to you know get there, I mean, you can see that that this idea that we are all devoid of emotion is is wrong. So why, you know, I think this this question of how do we, you know, bring this identity, which is so important to have people have, uh, you know, develop these, you know, global structures, uh, you know, that that's something that is such a, gosh, it's such a tough thing that, you know, it does still feel very taboo. And that's why a lot of people cover into the workplace or go in, you know, go into a professor, you know, the professor, because it's, you know, it's so easy. And there's this, you know, this fear of job security, you know, and that's kind of a little, a little bit kind of in this capitalistic society that's become such a huge factor. So what, you know, what can we do? And how can we address that? And I think there's just, you know, where do you bring your voice in? And how do you, what's the, when's the right time? You know, how comfortable are you? And that's, a, that's so hard because you know, one could argue that no matter how high up you get, you're, it's always difficult to say out loud, you know, oh, by the way, I'm gay and this matters, you know, sort of a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then Dr. Sack, do you, you want to go ahead and share your insights? Again, you're sort of the topic expert in this. It's your day, it's your job to sort of have these conversations every day and to, to structure a a credible argument that sort of says that this is what's happening, this is what the system is, and it's it doesn't look good for this community. <laughs> yeah, I, and certainly uh, I receive a lot of pushback. Um, I have countless um, uh, threatening and angry emails about the work that I put out publicly and um, for engaging in this topic at all. And um, when we scope out and ask, why does it feel this way? Why does it feel scary to raise these topics of conversation? What it points to is a broader issue in the professional culture of STEM itself. It's something that I've called depoliticization in the context of STEM. And it's this idea that STEM is supposed to be this pure space where who you are and who you love is not supposed to matter. And if we bring up those topics of conversation, we might be polluting the purity of scientific and engineering uh, expertise and innovation. But the problem is that idea is false. The idea that STEM can ever be purely removed from the, the, the messiness of politics and culture is itself a cultural idea because humans do STEM and humans have always done STEM with considerations of politics and culture and the social within it. And so 
there are conversations abound that non-LGBTQ persons have in STEM labs and STEM departments all the time about their kids, about their heterosexual partners, about um, the way that they present themselves in cisgenderly normative ways, and no one ever critiques them for being uh, politicizing. But because this is a, a minoritized identity, it means that raising it and having conversations about inequality for LGBTQ persons is seen not only as inappropriate socially, but potentially threatening to one's expertise. Uh, and so that's why it feels so hard and so threatening potentially to raise concerns about, about this thing. That's really about um, finding the most excellent uh, uh, inaction, uh, enacting of uh, STEM that we can. Thank you for that. Very insightful um, as always. Um, and so I think that kind of, this, I think this concludes our panel discussion unless um, any one of you have some more insights that you wanna give or Anything else you would want to share? Well, if not, then like I said, this concludes our panel discussion. I want to thank each of the panelists for taking time out of their day um, to sit here and give us some, some anecdotal stories of their experience as an LGBTQ plus person in STEM. Um, I want to thank uh, Silicon Valley Pride for carving out this space for us so we can have this important discussion. Um, and I hope that if you are in the audience and you are an LGBTQ plus person in STEM, that you felt seen through this conversation. Um, I know I did. I know that when I first came on to Dr. Check's work, I felt seen by her work. Um, when I met with each of the individuals in the panel, um, I felt a sense of camaraderie. So I hope that you got that too. Um, and for the allies who joined in today, I hope you were able to get a glimpse of what it's like to be an LGBTQ plus person in STEM um, and how you can better be an ally. Thank you. Thank you, Andres.